Good morning, everyone. We're really excited to have you with us today. Um, we're going to have a great webinar for you, and um, this is just going to be a great conversation. So today we're going to talk about consolidating BJC's diagnostic labs. We're going to hear from Rodney, who has led this project, um, and is going to he's going to give us some perspective on what the issues were around inefficiency and, and their current system, and then talk us through the, their approach to lean-led design, um, combining the lean tools with the with the design principles, um, and and use, uh, bridge that gap, and then. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the results um, and, and answer, then answer your questions at the end. So really excited to share this with you today. It's going to be a really um, kind of exciting discussion. Rodney um, is going to be our, our main presenter today, and he is a performance improvement manager at BJC Healthcare. Um, he comes to healthcare from a background in manufacturing and, and other industries, and so he's seen um, lean from many different perspectives. And he's going to share a little bit of, of his insight and his aha moments uh, working with Lean in healthcare today as well. Um, also, we want to extend a special thanks to Mike Lee. Um, he worked closely with Rodney to make this project happen. Um, he's a, also a performance improvement engineer. And he was able to really help with the data and the layouts and making this all come together and, and making it successful. So special thanks to him as well. And of course, uh, I am Brittany Hagedorn. I lead the U.S. Uh, healthcare work uh, for Simulate. So I will be facilitating today's discussion. With that, I want to hand it over to Rodney. He's going to talk about the problem with labs and their kind of current state. Um, he's going to talk about how they looked at their layouts, then uh, how they looked at their operations and their staffing levels, and then we'll open it up for questions. That, Rodney, it's all yours. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon to those that it's afternoon. Um, <clears throat> start off briefly and just let you know a little bit about uh, Barnes Jewish Hospital, the, the company, the system. Um, it is an academic hospital. The <clears throat> excuse me. The campus includes uh, Barnes Jewish Hospital and St. Louis Children's Hospital. Uh, it's a trauma level one emergency room. Approximately 1,200 beds with annual admissions around 55,000. Fire labs are important. Um, I think many of you know, and, and for those that don't, but 70% uh, uh, of all clinical decisions are based on some type of test results. And granted, they're not all lab, um, but a big percentage is. So this does play a big part in the flow of patients through the process and affects uh, the length of stay, which uh, some of you may refer to as, as wait time and um, some may have experienced uh, in, in your life. The current state of the, the labs. So this was kind of my aha moment, uh, just to share on a personal level. When I started working on this project, I was very surprised that there were six plus separate labs, um, all with different capabilities, and they were scattered across the campus. Um, for example, one of the labs may have been on the third floor on the east end of the building, and a different lab on the sixth floor at the west end of the building. <clears throat> so you can see, <coughs> excuse me, you can see the, I guess, inefficiencies and waste that were inherent in the current design or the current state. We had complications with the logistics. There's delays in processing, um, excess, excess staffing during different periods of the day. So um, just not a real good uh, setup when you look at it from a lean perspective. So what are the benefits of consolidation? Um, some of them, you step back and you go, wow, this is kind of obvious. But um, the big one is uh, centralized receiving, which really will help us simplify the logistics. So um, we don't have to move specimens from lab to lab, especially if there's splits, split specimens. Um, <clears throat> right now, we split a specimen. We take it to one lab. Uh, we may return it. So there's multiple handling points um, between various locations. Um, so, 
Rodney, when Go you ahead. say splits, I think you mean that you might get one sample in and then divide it up into multiple sub sub samples and then send it off and then return it and then somebody actually has to run it back and forth right across these different labs? Yes, exactly. So depending on the test that's required, um, there may be only one tube of uh, blood that is, you know, taken from the patient. They will actually split that and distribute to one, two, three different labs to do multiple tests based on the type of testing that's required. So um, you can understand the logistic kind of nightmare or difficulties uh, and the time that it adds to the process when we're doing that. So with that, if we can figure out a way to do that better, we potentially can reduce the turnaround time and get us quicker results and, and ultimately that's improving the service to the patients. Um, the other thing that kind of was a realization after we started looking at this was, while wow, this may give us the ability to actually increase capacity. So if we become more lean, more efficient, we're getting our turnaround time reduced, could we actually look at increasing capacity? So with the potential for additional patients to arrive at this campus next year, uh, we think that this will help in, in, in that increase as well. So Rodney, I just want to ask you, this is really interesting. Um, what was kind of the, the key driver for why now, right? Why uh, do the consolidation now? What were kind of the, the key factors that took it from a, well, someday it'd be nice to do this to a, yeah, let's, let's make this happen. Let's put in the multi-million to, to build this new lab. So I think, I think the biggest thing, and I've not been with the company a long time. Um, it's actually been quite short um, in, in my tenure, but I've noticed that there really is a commitment to a lean culture and kind of just changing the way of thinking. Um, and so I think the challenge there was what can we do different? And I think that's what stimulated this whole project. Um, so really it's the, the lean culture and what can we do different and kind of the challenge of how do we how do we handle these specimens less time? So instead of touching them three or four times, can we touch them one or two times? And, and kind of the focus on a central receiving point is is really the primary, I think, uh, driver for the whole thing. That makes a lot of sense. So I'll talk a little bit about the lean design approach. <clears throat> we really started off with kind of looking at things from a, a, ra a rapid improvement in perspective after taking a look at big picture, the value stream of, of the whole process. And we gathered people, frontline experts from all of the labs together uh, for five days, did a rapid improvement event. And the primary focus was to just come up with a layout that would work for everybody. Um, we also talked about simulating some of the staffing requirements, but there were still a lot of unanswered questions at that point. Um, at the end of the week, we were the team was challenged um, by one of the directors saying, have you really reduced the number of touches in, in the process. And so what happened was it, it's kind of ironic, and, and I think Brittany and I just kind of discovered this as we were talking about the project, but the iteration and kind of the, the process, we really went through a plan, do, check, act process. So we did the five-day rapid improvement event, thought, hey, things are, are better, but can we, because of the challenge, can we make it even better? So we stepped back and actually did an additional two-day, uh, what we call the mini RIE, to identify additional improvements. And, and with that, it kind of drove us to look at two different layouts and maybe two different approaches. Um, and that's where, I guess, the simulation really helped us kind of take that next step and, and look at some of the details of the layout and then kind of led to some of the staffing analysis. So some of the questions that came up during the design, so what's the best layout for the workstations? Um, I think a, a key to that was really having that frontline staff 
participate in the event and ask them what works. And they actually did some, during the event, did some human simulation. Uh, we used cardboard boxes to pretend it was a, a centrifuge, uh, cardboard boxes to pretend it was a computer and computer screen. So they actually did human simulation in the rapid improvement event before we plotted it into the simulation software. Um, another one was, how are we going to handle the ups and downs of the day and of the week for specimens? Because um, as many of you may, may know, um, the specimens are not coming in at a steady rate, just like patients don't come into the hospital at a steady rate. There's, there's ups and downs. We do have historical data that we can look at time periods and, um, and, and do some estimating based on that. But um, that was another question was, how are we going to handle when we go from 250 to 580 specimens? So, Rodney, I think that's really interesting. The aha moment for me was realizing that you know, when do all the specimens come in? It's not necessarily when you expect. And it's not just that you have random arrivals, but also every physician goes around and does the rounds and orders tests at 8 o'clock in the morning. And so at 9 o'clock, you're just totally swamped with samples. And from a lean perspective, it's like awful, right? And it's not what you would design if you had a choice. But recognizing that as a constraint in the system right now and, and being able to handle that, how do you build capacity for that? That's a really challenging environment to work in. Yeah, and I think, I think that it kind of leads into the next question that's on the slide is how do we staff um, for those changes and, and, you know, the ebbs and flows, um, how do we do that? And I think that's where having a good layout that was really kind of looking at one piece flow and, and try to consider how, how can we handle that. Um, I think that's uh, one of the things that was very positive in this whole project. Um, another thing is, noted on the slide, is there going to be enough space for six labs coming into one location? And the ironic thing is, we actually ended up with some extra space. So um, after the first iteration of the model and, and, and looking at things and then going back, uh, following our Plan Do Check Act, um, we ended up with like three or four different uh, workstations that weren't going to be utilized um, during normal processing rates, but allowed us some capacity uh, growth. Or if we get into emergent situations or um, some unexpected peaks, we can then open up those stations uh, for, uh, for handling those peaks. And then the last thing is just how are we going to handle the staff or how many staff will we need um, during these different time periods. So again, as Brittany said, you know, sometimes in the mornings, right now the labs are just crazy busy. They get slammed and then it dies off, but we've got people working eight hours. So now we can look at maybe moving resources around within one location um, and, and helping out from that perspective. So the proposed changes, um, we looked at consolidating the workspaces. So initially, the layout, and we'll, we'll show that here in just a little bit, but the layout was um, spread out more than what the final layout ended up. And we were talking about using uh, water spiders or walkers to receive a specimen either through a drop-off window or a pneumatic tube system, and then they would walk it to the next station, which was going to be a sort station and then the sort station would walk it to the next station. But looking at how can we consolidate the workspaces, um, we actually um, relocated the receiving person and kind of also combined the functions of those people. So we were actually able to, just from a, a value stream perspective, what part of this is really kind of still waste and not value added to the process? We were able to combine functions of, of workers or employees. And so the end result was we ended up with kind of a receiver and sorter all in one who then delivered to an, another station where the, the specimens are actually labbed in. Um, and the other thing I touched on already was 
the single piece flow. So as you can imagine, things are coming in from a pneumatic tube system and one of them drops and another one drops and I think we know what happens. We take the one that's on the top of the pile, which means the one that came first, it's waiting even longer. And the same thing with our drop off windows, it's you know happening today. Someone hand delivers three or four specimens in a bag and then another person drops off three or four and another person drops off three or four. Well, before we get to the first one, we've got to go through the other 11 or whatever the number is. So again, we're making our customers wait even longer because we're not utilizing single piece flow and not utilizing um, first and first out, which are some basic lean principles that we really want to be doing. So we, have, we came up with two different layouts, and you can see on the screen, the first layout you can see is obviously not as clean uh, as the second one. But again, that first layout, I just want to point out that this was way better than what we had today. Um, and it was a result of the rapid improvement event. It was the result of having frontline staff participating, giving their input as the experts, and really understanding the flow and everything that it takes to perform these tests. And the second one is a result of those same people, I guess, stepping up to the challenge of someone saying, is it really the best you can do? Can you do better? Uh, and then coming back with additional two days and looking at combining that receiving and sorting person all in one. So Rodney, I just want to point out here for a second, one of the things that I really like about the way you've got this laid out is you can see the different colored lines which all represent the different types of lab samples that are coming in. You can see where they're going and what's happening to them um, and kind of where all that congestion is going to be. So I think that's kind of a nice side benefit, you know, even before you've run the models and really got any of the results, to be able to see some of the, the flows through the space. Yeah, so and really nice. I, I'll jump ahead here, I guess, a little bit before we get to people seeing the simulation, but <clears throat> that's one thing with the software, being able to use different colors for different people, and you can hide staff and show one or the other. Um, that really helped out in looking at, I guess, the walk patterns, um, and we actually were able to modify some of the walk patterns. Um, that we're able to just kind of kind of play with and model. So why a superior design? What uh, you know? What comes out of this? I think the biggest thing is that we were able to um, reduce the time that specimens were actually waiting at the stations. Um, and you can see here, this is just a, a simple graph, but um, and just comparing the initial layout to the improved layout. Um, where we combine functions uh, within staff. Um, it just, that and just changing the layout of some of the stations made a huge improvement in the number of minutes that something was sitting at a workstation waiting. So, Ronnie, I love this. This is like my favorite graph in the whole thing because it's, it's so clear that option two is better than option one, which is far superior to what the current state is, right? But this isn't even looking at the current state. But just that dramatic improvement across the board, really there's no arguing with it, right? This is the better option. This is the right decision to make. The, the second mini RIE was very successful based on these metrics. And that is just super exciting because it's so easy to then make good decisions. Um, yeah, I think, love this. I think that's, you know, the key with, with lean, as, as many of you may know, but you don't stop. Um, you, you respond to challenges to continually improve, and I think we did it in a short period of time, and um, the tool that we used here um, helps it be non-emotional and making a decision of which one is better. Um, it's, um, it's quite evident when you look at just this very simple graph, um, but again, it's a result of, of kind of going through that iterative process and not, not stopping. Yeah. I think as, as a designer, if I'm looking at multiple layouts, you know, maybe it's not two, maybe I've got three or four potential designs, right, in different structures, not just the lab, but also the lab and where its adjacency is relative to 
the ED and the OR and all these other you know, pieces to the puzzle, to be able to quantify that and say, okay, this is why this is a, a better choice, and or these are your trade-offs that you're making. You're going to spend more here, but actually this is the impact you're going to have. That's just incredibly valuable. Um, Absolutely. It's an engagement tool. Absolutely. And it, one other thing, it, it's funny because this big RIE, the five day and then the two days, has actually led to, I think, eight or nine different other smaller rapid improvement events. So now we're actually doing rapid improvement events within the new structure, the new layout. So we're taking just departments or areas, and they're really doing kind of a rapid improvement event for the workstation. So they did an initial simulation, the human simulation that I referred to earlier. Now they're looking at the actual workstation within that area in the new lab. So it's, uh, it, it's gaining momentum and people are getting excited. One, they're going to have a new shiny workplace, but they get to kind of set it up and, and have the input. Awesome. The next thing um, was just talking about staffing plans. So, you know, we felt we had a real good layout, but then the questions started flying, okay, well, how many of the registration people, how many of the sorters, how many, how many of these people do we need? So, again, kind of going back to this non-emotional um, kind of approach, let's look at it more data-driven, and I think that's where the tool really helped us. Um, we had a good layout. Everyone was happy. We um, had a good plan for one touch or minimized touches, uh, single piece flow, first in, first out, all those good principles from a design perspective. Now we can kind of put that into play and, and use the model for, for staffing requirements. So what happened was we looked at, in this example here is just a couple of the stations, <clears throat> the sorting station and register station. We looked at what would happen if we only had three of these water spiders or walker uh, type of persons, and we compared it to three versus four, five, six, and seven, as you can see on the graph. At the sort station, we saw um, a decent amount of improvement when we went from three to four and then four to five, but as you can see from five to six and six to seven, it kind of flattened out. And the same thing with, with register. So, you know, the, the, I guess the target is maybe five is what we really need to kind of target as our optimum right now to start off uh, launching uh, for these, these stations. And, you know, is it really worth adding additional FTEs um, to that sixth and seventh person when the number of minutes that we're saving is probably not as significant and not as not too significant for our service level agreements to the other departments and ultimately the customer. So these numbers here were based on just 250 arrivals um, per hour, but it allows us to, I guess, study the model and say, what if we had not 250, we had maybe additional amounts, but we can look at that from a, um, a staffing requirement of five and what happens. And that takes us to the next slide. So we just look at the average number of minutes. If we're using five of these water spiders or walkers um, at 250 arrivals per hour, and then again at 420 arrivals and 580, you can see the number of minutes goes up significantly because we didn't increase the number of water spiders. But it allows us to step back and say, okay, if we're not going to meet our service level agreements, we're not going to meet the customer's requirements, um, this may be a decision point that, all right, the hours that we have, 420 or 580, maybe we add a sixth or seventh person at that time, and maybe it's only for two hours. So can we redeploy staff during those busy times um, to, to help with those peaks. And I think that's really the, the gist of this slide here is that, uh, you know, you can see that, again, it's non-emotional and it's, it's data-driven. Okay. Great. Thanks, Rodney. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and pull up Lean HCX and actually share this with everybody live. Um, so if you just give me one moment to pull up the software. 
So LeanHDX is actually a web-based uh, tool. And so I'm just going to load it here in my browser. Okay, so you should all be able to see the screen. This is actually Rodney's model. This is the second layout. Um, this should look very familiar. We were just looking at this image. Um, I'm going to reset the model, and then I'm going to start it running. And what we're going to see is actually these little colored dots are going to be running around, moving through space. And what we can see is where people are going, where the specimens are being uh, transferred to, uh, which stations are busy. Right now, everybody's very busy, so you can see there's somebody in each one of these stations. Um, and we can actually see how that flow is going to happen. Um, there's a few things that are happening here. Um, first of all, right here in the middle, you can see these big arrows. There's two of them here, and there's also one down here. Those are the three places that demand is entering the system. Uh, so at the bottom there, that's actually the drop-off window. And then the two in the middle here are the um, two system. Samples are coming in. They're getting handled by uh, the receiving desk. They're moving out to um, registration, problem resolution, manual processing, depending on what they need. Um, and that's what you see all those colors are for. Um, each color represents a different path that the sample might take. Um, and so we can see where, for example, if we follow the red ones, they're coming into receiving, then they're going to registration, then they're going over here for manual processing, and then they're heading up for automation. Um, everything is leaving out this back exit point, um, which is where automation is, and that's actually where the samples are going to be processed. Um, at that point, there are a few minutes from actually having the results back. So really, this front part is where uh, there's the human factor and there's a lot of variability in processing time. Um, so that's what's happening. Um, we can also see there's a few numbers on the screen here. They're a little bit small. Um, but we can see right now there's 12, there's 11 samples waiting in this uh, problem resolution station. Um, that's things that are waiting, things that are being processed, all of the work that's being done. We can monitor what's happening in the system. I'm just going to run this forward, speed it up a bit, um, because I don't want to watch all of those little dots run around every time. So we've just run it forward to the end. And now we can actually look at a few results. So this is um, for a given set of demand, for a given set of staff levels. Uh, we can actually see the amount of time that different staff are being utilized. So in this case, we can see our sorter is very busy. Our water spider, or actually, sorry, this is idle time. Our sorter has a bit of time on their hands. Um, our water spider has a little bit, um, but they are also running like crazy. So if we look down here at the bottom, um, they're the ones that are really doing all of the walking. They're handing off. They're moving samples from one location to the next. Uh, they're running around. And we can actually see how far they've run. So in this short time frame, we just ran it for two hours to, to get the mill run quickly. Um, you can see they've walked 48,000 feet between the five of them. Right, so they're putting on some, some real miles, and we can actually get a real feel for uh, what's happening. Just a side note there, I think this is really important when we think about nursing as well, um, this kind of walk time. Um, we hear stories, you see the studies about how far nurses have to walk on the inpatient units or in the emergency room, putting on miles per day. Um, and this is a, a serious problem because it's taking time away from patients away from actual productive work, right? um, value-added work. And so this is something that we definitely want to pay attention to. And then, of course, up in the top right, you can actually see utilization. Our manual processor is very busy. Our problem resolver is very busy. Um, our sorter actually is, is handling OK, which is good, because that's the rate-limiting step. Um, if, if that's the first step, um, when patients uh, or when lab samples um, arrive, they've got to go through sort first. And if that's the bottleneck, then we're going to have some significant issues, and we're going to have the piling up that Rodney was talking about uh, earlier. So that's an important metric to pay attention to. There's all sorts of results in here, all sorts of details that we can go through. But I just wanted to kind of show you what was happening uh, so you can get a feel for what we're talking about when we say you know, it's the simulation and we talk about the model. Um, and it's really just all about these, the model running forward um, and being able to visually see what's happening. Um, in the system and tracking those results. Um, we also have um, options to look at things like um, waiting times and, and capacity utilization, those sorts of metrics. Um, and then the other thing I just want to point out is there's a, a share option up here. This is really powerful. Um, from my perspective, I think the, 
one of the most important things we can do as uh, designers, as engineers, as folks who are doing this analysis is to be able to share that analysis with somebody else and let them actually get their hands on it. Um, and so this lets us send the model to the director of nursing, lets us send it to the manager of the lab space, whoever it is that we really need buy-in from, and they can then go in and play with these numbers, experiment with the staffing level, um, test out different levels of demand, stress test different things, and get buy-in and really get their arms around what's happening in the model and, and get to trust it. And then um, obviously we can make some great decisions with it. So I just want to point that out as well because I think that's a really important feature um, that we haven't really touched on yet. So if you have any questions about how that works, feel free to, to head to the website, leanhdx.com, or we can also answer those questions at the end of the uh, session here today. Great. So I just want to kind of wrap everything up. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the presentation uh, from Rodney. I think there's a lot of great insights in there um, in all of these kind of areas. Um, obviously, the data-driven decision-making, as Rodney was saying, taking the emotion out of the decision, using the quantified results to, to make decisions about layouts and staffing and, and what really needs to happen. Being able to build and test scenarios and especially the quick part, right? It's one thing to be able to build a model and it takes me six months to, to validate it, right? But by that point, it's no longer useful. Um, Lean HDX is a simplified interface, um, web-based interface, easy to learn, and really, you know, we've kind of, with Lean HDX, you can build and, and start testing scenarios in a couple of hours. Um, I've seen it a couple times now. I had a group. Um, just last week, they had a model up and running in about an hour and a half, and they were testing out different layout scenarios. Absolutely incredible um, and, and really timely results that we're able to then use um, to make decisions. Obviously, highly visual. You've seen that already. And as Rodney was pointing out, when we can integrate it with our existing lean tools, that's really where the power comes in um, and where we can really uh, make some great, great improvements to the system. So with that, I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, I think we have a couple that have come through, so I'm going to start with those. Please feel free to add any other things that are on your mind. Okay, so the first question I think is for you, Rodney, um, and it's really about how long did it take to build the model and actually get these results? Um, both kind of, I think, two sides to that, right? How long does it actually take to build the model, and then how long is the whole project? taken? Um. So the model, I would say, took um, three or four hours to build. Um, and I part of that was I was learning the software. So, um, but I think once I understood the features and functions to actually build the model, it took about three, three to four hours. So um, I didn't consider that to be a very long time. Um, and then what was the, the other part of the question was? How long is the project <coughs> as a whole taken? So the rapid improvement event um, was actually in January, the first five day one. The follow up two day was, I believe, end of February, beginning of March. Um, equipment is in the lab now. Um, there are, some of the departments are projected to go in there before the end of the year. So we'll move departments in incrementally. Um, but next year, beginning first quarter, that's when everything's going to be going live. Um, they're utilizing a floor in a newer building um, that the company has, has erected. And so the, the whole project um, probably been going on for a year and a half right now. But I would say the, the meat of it has really been happening since, uh, since the beginning of this year. Interesting. So obviously, construction takes a long time. Absolutely. Um, and there's been this kind of PDCA approach, right, for the iterative approach. So. Absolutely. And that's where, you know, we mentioned Mike earlier. He was very instrumental in, I guess, all of that up front with the construction folks and kind of being the liaison and, and working with all the people in the labs. Um, so one other question for you. Um, what kind of data did you need in order to build the model? What were kind of the key assumptions that you needed to look at? So I think the actual layout of, 
you know, to, to scale, that was important. Um, so when we were looking at how many miles those people are walking, it's, it's a real number. And then the other one is just the number of arrivals per hour. That was really the, you know, the biggest thing. Um, again, once they hit the sorting station, then they, with the tool, we were able to show it going to the different locations. So there was really nothing for us to think about at that point, which was really helpful. Um, so if, as long as we knew the average number of arrivals per hour, um, then we can, you know, do some kind of estimated staffing plans. And, and I'm sure, you know, when we get there, we're going to find things that we can make better. And uh, but it at least gives us a realistic target going in, instead of just throwing a dart at the dartboard. Well, like what you said, <coughs> realistic number is not yes. not coming up with them. Um, okay, so another question here, uh, what are the key feature differences between Lean HDX and other simulation packages? Um, so I'll go ahead and speak to that, and Rodney, if you have any thoughts as well, I know you've used some other things. Um, Lean HDX is really designed for a couple of things. One, being entirely web-based, uh, which means you have automatic saving, you have easy to share scenarios, there's no software downloads, um, and that's really going to simplify the uh, adoption process and also the the user engagement process, if we can share scenarios and things of that sort. Um, the second thing is, we've talked about a little bit, the speed to build. Um, very simplified uh, relative to a lot of other simulation packages. Um, very easy to drag and drop, draw your connections, and start running. Um, I, I joked about the couple, of, the six months to build a model, but really, you know, I've seen that happen. Um, and we get bogged down in details and in perfect models that, um, that just requires so many assumptions and, and programming and all of these other things behind the scenes. Um, Lean HDX is really taking care of a lot of that for us. And so it's going to be much faster to build and start running. And then the, the other thing that um, maybe I haven't spoken about in so far today is the scenarios comparison part of it. Um, so actually, we didn't see this uh, live. You have essentially folders. Um, and subfolders uh, within Lean HDX. So when you log in, you have your projects, and then you have multiple scenarios that you can save underneath that, um, which may be different, fundamentally different layouts, uh, like in Rodney's case. And then within that, if I run different, say, demand levels or staffing levels or um, different processing times, different staff assignments, within that same scenario, I can actually compare the results really quickly. Um, anytime I'm running a scenario, I can save those results, make a change, run it again, and populate that all into those charts. Um, so some of the charts you saw um, are, are, are the kind of results that you can get straight out of uh, Lean HDX without having to do any extra analysis or summary stats or export. Uh, that's all built in for you. So um, definitely easy to get those results um, specifically in scenario comparison. Because ultimately, I don't really want to know that it's going to take me 12.5 minutes to, you know, get through this process. What I want to know is that this layout is superior to that layout, or yes, I can handle this demand, or no, I can't handle this demand. And so that's where the comparison is really the core of what you're trying to do with any simulation model. Um, and so that's, that's a key feature as well. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting something along the way, but I think those are the three things that really stand out for me uh, relative to other packages. Rodney, I don't know if you have anything that you want to I'll just, I mean, if the package itself is, it's very easy to use. I found it very user friendly. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know if this is the right verbiage or not, but it's, it's really a, a, a quick kind of down and dirty tool to use. I mean, it was, because it's so simplistic, um, I think, you know, if we really wanted to go deeper into the simulation and wanted to, you know, get some of those more finite details, we could do that maybe with another package. Um, this this was perfect for this scenario and, 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 you know, what we had. And I think, you know, that's something I've said all along. This tool or this software is perfect for what we were doing. Um, again, it's, it's easy. It's very user-friendly. Um, 
So I've got a couple of other questions here. How long, Rodney, did it take you to learn Lean HDX? I think we've covered this a little bit. Yeah, I mean, honestly, um, I sat with Brittany for two hours maybe at most and just kind of walked me through the features in that. And then I just, uh, a lot of it I, I really just kind of figured out on my own. It, it, it truly is that easy to learn and that easy to use. I, I did reach out and ask some questions, and, but I, I mean, I really think this is something that somebody can probably pick up and just start using, really. It's, uh, it's pretty simplistic. Awesome. Um, I'll just point out that if you are interested and you want to test that question for yourself, um, there are tutorial videos on the website, and if you sign up for a trial, you can go in and start experimenting, and I think you'll find that what Rodney's saying is, is true, that you can pick up most of the details just by playing around and, um, and experimenting yourself. So um, definitely go check that out if you're interested in, in that part of it. Another question, does Lean HDX perform the statistical distribution analysis for arrival patterns? Answer to that would be no. Um, what you're going to want to do is look at your historical data and understand what those patterns are um, and then plug them in. Lean HDX is really designed, as Rodney was saying, to make the analysis quick and easy. Um, and so what you're looking at are average arrival rates. You're looking at minimum, maximum times. You're looking for summary statistics that can get you started and get you going. Um, that's really all you need to be able to compare some of these scenarios. Um, so it's not going to automatically do all the, the heavy lifting of the stats for you. Um, but you really don't need a lot of fancy statistical analysis to run Lean HDX. So while it's not built in, I don't think it's really necessary for the kinds of analysis that you're going to use Lean HDX for. Looks like we have covered all the, the key questions for today. If you have anything else that comes up, please do feel free to reach out. We can connect you up with Rodney. I'm sure he'd be happy to Absolutely. answer questions um, or join us on the LinkedIn forum, another great place to have discussions. Um, we will also post all of this question and answer on the website, um, so do check that out um, if I, um, you have uh, any thoughts or you want to double check what we talked about today. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being so engaged and, and asking those um, kind of critical questions. And uh, we will look forward to talking to you again, and feel free to share. Take care, everybody. <laughs>